You're listening to a Count Out Podcast. to the very first episode of the Countout Network's new podcast, Stardom Road, with you is your host, Sky Edwards, and with my co-host, Trent. Trent, you know, you and me have done this a few times. Yeah, but yeah. This is new. This is new. It's I'm finally actually getting co-hosting duties on one of your podcasts yeah. that isn't the Ocean Cyclone show. I'm not used to um, that. <laughs> yeah yeah normally it's just like yes it's trent he's guessing again like yeah you're sick of hearing this voice now you know every time you click on start and road you're gonna have to hear this annoying accent so mm. hooray yes so as as you have seen on the nice picture or um as you heard from my voice and now trent's voice this podcast is of course stardom road mm-hmm. uh the the goal here it's, i don't know if it's a goal but the fun for us really is that we're going to go down the history of stardom. And it feels fitting now because, you know, you go through the podcast of the Joshi world, right? I have 17 of them, you know, that's fine. (laughs) I have 17 of them, but, you know, there's some stardom podcasts, very good stardom podcasts. I'm friends with all of them that have those podcasts. There's, you know, other Joshi podcasts that aren't mine. Um, And they suck. And well, no. um, there's other history podcasts in mm. Joshi, but none touch on the history of stardom as a podcast. And that's what we're going to do here. We are going to go bi-weekly. So we're not going to do this every single week because there's, there's a lot of wrestling that's on current day, right? Yeah. <laughs> like everyone knows that I watch a ton. Um, we also have lives too. So it's like uh, debatable. Well, the there's a rumor. There's a rumor that some of us have lives, but uh, it can't be verified just yet. But our goal, of course, is to inform everyone listening, to mm-hmm. educate ourselves. That's the fun of this. We are going yeah. to go down the Stardom Road and see all of what brought it to its height today. Because, of course, Stardom is one of the most popular promotions in the world today. And luckily for us, Compared to the WWEs of the world and the New Japans of the world, we only have to go down 11 years of history. (laughs) And the good part of that is half of that history is not on Stardom World. So we can't (laughs) cover like half of their history. So it's really only like a couple of years here and there. Like next week we'll be covering Shuri's reign because that's all we've got to run with. (laughs) Yeah, so of course we are going to jump here and there and everywhere. Mm. This isn't going to be a chronological order uh podcast it will be sometimes there'll be weeks that we go in order but we want to explore the history and there is so much from the undercard Mm. to the of course amazing main event to freedom to shuri like you said and utami and all these things right and and jungle kiona of course and Uh, like there 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 are so many roads and episodes to go down so that's why, of course, this is the Stardom Road, and I'm sure you can figure out why we're calling it Stardom Road. But wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Shout out to yeah. If, if you get it, you can uh, <laughs> say it to us, and we'll give you like a an e pat on the back. You get yeah. to be in the secret club who can piece together what the road portion of Stardom Road. Act- right. I mean, if you can get the road part but not the Stardom part, I'm actually impressed. Um, yeah, you, I mean, yeah. But, yeah, we'll see what happens there. The reality is, like, yeah, we've got just over a decade of history to come through here. And the good thing is Stardom has grown so much and there's so many new people to the product. And a lot of those people maybe don't necessarily know the full history of Stardom or Mm -hmm. even really much of the history. Like, if you came in just a couple of years ago when Bushiroad acquired them, you've got eight, nine years of stuff to sort of discover and learn. And we hope that this podcast can kind of open up those doors a little bit because it can be daunting, even with yeah. it, it doesn't have the WWE or New Japan length of history. Right. But to go back and look, oh, there's, you know, 
years and years of stuff here. Where do I begin? What do I actually look for? Mm. Well, hopefully this podcast can open it up a bit and maybe explain some questions you might have, like how did this person become popular? Why do they matter in the start of Mythos? How did factions become a thing? Because if you've only been watching a couple of years, that's factions are just a thing in stardom, but they weren't always so dominant and prevalent on the stardom landscape. Yeah. And all those factions were created, right? We're going to see how they were created. That's the fun of this. And it's funny, the reason I'm doing, well, I wanted to originally do this because I had this plan for months. Like Mm. this wasn't like, I just was like, Hey Trent, let's just do this. No, I've had, (laughs) I've had this idea for months, you know, Ryan, uh, one half of the people that run count on, of course, he wants to kill me because I, I said I would do it long ago. And then I, I backed out because I was like, no, I, I, I don't have the time. I need a co-host. And I finally found Trent. I mean, I, I've talked to Trent millions <laughs> of times. Found me. It's like, oh, that's you. right. He's this other person who has time to do a podcast. That, um, but also, but also you care about Starm just as much as I do. And I think that's very important. Right. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I I can't just get someone that's getting into Joshi or I just can't get someone that, that frankly doesn't care enough. Like you have to care about Storm to want to do this. Yes. And that's what we do. Right. We care about Storm. I'm so excited to start this because you and me haven't seen everything that Storm ever done. No, we I are not are... experts of their no. old history. We weren't following from 20 years. We're fans. You know? That's what we yes. are. Yes. We're fans. And we want to know more about it. And so in many ways, like, we do know some of the history, but this is going to be a learning experience for us as well. And we might even come on the podcast and go, wow, I didn't realize such and such was that good until diving back into this. Mm. So hopefully we can learn along with you. Hopefully you're learning a little more than us because it could be awkward if it's the other way around on a podcast that you're not actually a part of. But this can be a fun journey down this road that we can yeah. take together. Yeah, I, I've I've talked to so many people that ask me like, oh, where should I go back in time, right, to watch certain starter matches? Where should I go? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I, that's that's just such a that's just a que- that's such a broad question. I mean, yeah, I could send you to 2019 and you could be busy for mm. a very long time alone, right? And it but looks so different. The way from I 2022 start them exactly. <laughs> and and the, the fun of this is because so the reason I got into Star and this is how we're going to kind of get through this episode is because mm. I think everyone should know how we became fans, and then we have a special match to review. That really kicks us all off here. But the reason I got into stardom, of course, was I, I'm sure enough people have listened to me by now to know this. But if you're brand new, here's the story. You know, COVID hits, right? 2020, pretty much all wrestling shut down. I wasn't really feeling the WWE or AEW anymore. I was like, this is whatever. You know, talk, talk to my good friend Alex. He gives me like the 79 match list of stardom matches from the beginning of history from the beginning of its history to the most recent right so the first match i ever saw this is pretty funny was nanai takahashi versus arisa shiki like and that's arisa shiki long before she was arisa shiki Mm. and and, you know went on from there i was locked in and as you you all know now uh, if you listen to my podcast I'm a little bit of a stardom fan every single week. Of course, I have those podcasts to talk about that. But Trent, I know you have a different road into becoming a fan, of course, but one that's just as unique because I think that's the beauty of stardom. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people kind of, there's periods in stardom's time where people get into the product. And I think that Mm -hmm. sort of the pandemic era is a really good jumping on point for a lot of people, especially with all the promotions shutting down or having to radically change. For me, I kind of jumped on on one of the other boom periods, which was when the freedom was starting to come into real prominence. Io Shirai, Mayu Watani, Kairi Hojo, formerly known as Kairi Sane, now currently known as Kairi. Uh, Don't worry, we'll be covering the star, the freedom in the future episodes. So if you're new to that, we'll cover all that as well. But that's sort of where I... Yeah, that, that's where I sort of started to dabble into stardom because I was on, it was I think it was just on a wrestling forum and I was getting disillusioned with WWE as you, you do, you know, often as people most fall do. in and out of the product. Yeah, and I was looking for something new and my exposure to women's wrestling had been Attitude Era and Ruthless Aggression Era women's wrestling. 
which isn't a great way to perceive women's wrestling as worthy of watching. So I was, and all of a sudden I started seeing these gifts and sort of footage of these uh, Japanese women doing stuff. I'm like, what the hell are they doing? That looks like top tier wrestling. And I'm not aware of them being able to do this. So I started investigating more and more and I found out about stardom and sort of dabbled in the uh, videos that had been left online in the less than legal places and then subscribed to <laughs> Stardom World. Probably mid 2017, I think, is when I was I started subscribing. And I've been on the stardom train ever since, you know, not necessarily full stream from the start. You know, I stuck with the wrestlers I knew and began to expand seeing those. And now I'm at the point where I watch pretty much every show and I'm doing podcasts about this stuff and writing about it and all that jazz. So, yeah, that's that was my stardom road to get here. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to accidentally use road a lot. It's not even on purpose now. Um, I've already <laughs> used it like seven times in this show. Um, that's Tim not. A, would think be uh, kicking us for using the title straight away. I think it's just something I say truthfully. But mm. so you know our roads to fandom here. Um, everyone's different, uh, and everyone's special, of course. But there's so many lovely uh, moments in Stardom history that not enough people have, and. And that's again the excitement of here, and we're gonna go over so many things. You, you know, we talked about the read them. They're gonna have who knows how many episodes. Like if we're gonna count singular episodes, they're gonna have the most. Okay, I can, I can clue you in on that because there's title reigns, there's them as a trio, there mm-hmm. is them as singles. Like there's, oh, there's against tournaments. each other, tag teams, factions. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible. Um, we're going to talk about Nanai Takahashi, of course, the first mm. ever World of Stardom champion, someone who is prominent once again in stardom. Yes. Uh, not necessarily to people's happiness or anything, but she is around. Uh, we're going to talk about Arisu Shiki, who I brought up earlier, and her road. And, you know, she's an interesting one because we're going to talk to her about the, her at the beginning. Yes. And then we might not talk to her for like a few months or a long time, you know? But she is an interesting one to talk about as well. You know, Kagetsu, if I named mm. off every special wrestler, that would just get tiring for everyone. So I'm not going to do that. But that's, I'm just trying to psych you up. I just punched my microphone. So you can tell I'm He's jacked that up excited. That stuff. I'm that excited. Uh, but there's just, uh, it's it's so exciting. And, and I want to talk about where Stardom is now before we really go into it because... Mm. We are going to go into a time where they were nowhere close to this. The show that we're going to talk about today had 400 fans at Shinjuku. It was a produce show. Didn't even have a stardom title to it yet because it wasn't a stardom show. Yeah, the first stardom uh, road episode we're talking about isn't actually about a stardom show per se. But that's part of the fun of the journey because they didn't just go, here's a new promotion called Stardom. Let's have some fun with it. There was build to it. There was development. and There was wrestlers to introduce. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, very important wrestler to introduce. Someone that you know, I don't, I don't know if enough people know about her impact, right, and mm, her importance mm. to stardom. So we'll, we'll get to that. But let's talk a little bit about today's stardom, what they're doing. Uh, we're not going to go full in because then me and Trent will be here for three hours. Um, but you know, you and me have reviewed shows about stardom we've talked about stardom for countless hours Mm. where do you believe you know as we sit here in 2022 where do you believe they'll be in five years i mean the wrestling landscape is so tough to predict because like if i look at you know where stardom was five years ago did i see them being at the level they are now absolutely not too many different things had to happen, too many things you couldn't have predicted. I didn't see a global pandemic shutting everything down for six months, and I didn't see this promotion, of all promotions, being the ones to you know, rise through that and become a completely new level. I think providing everything keeps going the way it does, and they can survive issues and mishaps. There's no reason why they can't be at the point where they're running a Tokyo Dome show by themselves mm. um, and running Ryugoku Hall not regularly, but like doing that three or four times a year, maybe doing Nippon Budokan, and basically at the point where they're outgrowing all of the small mini venues. But, you know, mm-hmm. for a while there, they're running, you know, uh, Shinkiba First String on the regular, and they can't right. do that anymore. 
I think we're going to get to a point where all across Japan, it's like, oh, this venue's a bit small for the kind of show we want to run. Mm-hmm. And that's really exciting because they could just stick in Tokyo, but they've really worked hard on building the entire domestic scene. And hopefully in those five years, globally, has been getting a bit more love and attention as well. I feel pretty good about that. Uh, I think you're right on the point there. And the reason I asked that question is, right, you know, we're we're about to go back in time, but just mm. thinking where this company is about to be as we go into its its new opening period, it's going to be fun just to think about just sitting there like, wow, this company right here is running a, the Sumo Hall at the end of the mm. year every year now. That's crazy, right? It's like those types of things. That's the fun thing to think about. Um, you know, talk about stardom. It doesn't have to be current. It could be all time. I think we should tell everyone some of our favorites in stardom mm-hmm, history. Mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, cause stardom, you know, our favorite promotion. Sure. But yeah, it's because of the wrestlers, right? It's always because mm. of the wrestlers. And it's not the name of the promotion that I'm a right. fan for. Yeah. And we should just probably, you know, start it off the right way. Uh, Mayu Yutani, of course. Um, yeah. If you listen to any podcast that I have, even if it's a non Joshi podcast, <laughs> I put over my Iwatani. Life uh, finds a way. It, it does. Like I was on the flagship and I put over my Iwatani, right? Like I just can't not because she, to me, is the greatest of all time. Not only is she my favorite of all time, and someone pointed something out to me, you know, of course, everyone knows Cage Match. I've rated one wrestler on there. And it is Mayu Yutani. I gave her a perfect 10. She is like, I think she's like the third on there, like overall, which mm. is crazy. She's only behind Kobashi and Masawa. So, like, I'm not crazy when I say she's the greatest of all time. Um, and I know Trent, you, you know, she's your favorite wrestler too. So mm. I just feel like we're we're not gonna talk about Mayu in full depth necessarily in these first couple episodes. I'm of course lying. We're gonna talk about her all the time. But she'll etch a way in, but you know, be rest assured there's going to be a lot of my heavy episodes, but we're yeah. not going to dump it all on you all at once because that's a no. it's a long journey and there's a lot of stages to Mayu's career that need to be yes. covered. Yes, and while Mayu is stardom in a lot of ways, right? She mm. debuts on their very first show and she's thankfully still there being the best. Um, it wasn't always bright skies and shiny rainbows for Mayu Iwatani and that's really going to be the fun of this seeing her Mm. develop over time and you know at times struggle to figure it out even like you know you you don't you don't become the greatest in a day uh but I just want to say you know the reason I love Star so much a lot of it goes and I can appreciate and credit Mayu Iwatani because she's just so easy to latch on to as a fan because you're like mm. you know she does things that i would do you know she's a little clumsy well, a little clumsy she's very <laughs> clumsy she puts her heart into everything right and, and she just cares so much and that's just so easy to care about as a fan because you want mm. someone like that that cares as much as you do um so trent without making us go on forever because i could and i'm trying to stop myself um, why do you think Mayu is so important to not only your fandom, you don't have to tell me why she's important to start them. Everyone knows that, yeah. but like, why is she important to your fandom and part of the reason, you know, you're even willing to do this? Cause I, again, I think we can agree without Mayu Itani, we're not doing a podcast like this. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, as I mentioned, I got in through to freedom and of the freedom, it was Mayu who caught my attention, which was weird at the time because as I was discovering stardom, everyone was talking about Eo Shirai and those who mm-hmm. weren't talking about Eo was talking She'll about Kyrie. a million episodes too. Yeah. Mayu <laughs> felt like the black sheep of that trio in a lot of ways. You know, she wasn't quite at their level. She kind of needed to be held up through there. And like, you could see that in her presentation, even in those early years of the freedom. And I think what made her so special was, you could buy into what she was doing so much. And so much of that comes down to her selling. You know, she is one of the best sellers in wrestling. She makes you believe everything she's going through. And it's that dichotomy of, as you mentioned, like she's so relatable in kind of the, the personality side of things. Someone so immensely athletic and skilled and talented, almost superheroic in a way that, you know, professional yeah. wrestling is like comic books and superheroes. So, so much of like a Wonder Woman yet is so relatable when you get her immediately away from the bell. 
you know, yeah. you see her do stuff like, yeah, I get that. I could see myself <laughs> in that situation. It, it's endearing, and you can't help but want to support her and cheer for her, even when she's at this point where she's the icon of stardom, one of the greatest of all time. She still feels like someone you've kind of got to underdog support. That's so difficult to pull off, but she manages it that. Is. It's endearing. It's gen. Uh, it's genuine. Yeah, she's figured. She's figured out the the play. Right, if mm. you're gonna run a play to win a game she knows that play and she runs it every time no matter the match no matter the situation she always has the play to get it done um whether she has to be the underdog or the one running the match right running yeah. the ship um and i'll and before we get into our topic of course we'll name one wrestler that of course is we're big fans of that isn't the mayu Yutani. uh so trent you know what i'll let you i'll let you go first don't take Longer than three minutes. Well, I mean, I'm I'm going to go less than that because let's be honest. If you're aware of me as a, a content <laughs> creator at all, you know the answer is Jungle Kiona. Yeah, she was the first outside of the threedom that really drew my attention and caught me when it came to getting into stardom. Uh, we will no doubt be covering her at some point down here. Every You've probably heard me rail on rail about her on ad nauseum. She's just fantastic. A lot of the same uh, situations with Mayu. She's a genuine underdog that you just want to support and see do mm. well. She draws you in, and she's immensely talented in the ring. It's a great combination. I clearly have a type. Yeah, yeah. I mean, never mind. I'm not going to. Wrong show. This isn't the show. This isn't the <laughs> just show. Just a happy we, space. I, yeah, I save that for the other shows. Uh, we'll talk, of course, Jungle has a long, long career of stardom uh, that we will also touch on in Heavy detail down the line. Mm-hmm. Mine, of course, I already hinted at was Ritsu Shiki. Um, just one of the most special talents to ever step in a wrestling ring that didn't mm-hmm. get a lot of time in a wrestling ring. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I, half the reason I'm so excited to do this show is because I'm going to get to talk about both periods of her career. Uh, she has some of my favorite matches of all time. Again, from both periods of her career, that's a very special one that I will talk about um, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, which is always fun, but yeah, I mean, if you if you got a chance to see Arisa, or if you ever see people talk about Arisa and never have seen her, she was that special. Uh, she has like 150 mm. matches to her name. She has one of the best Wonder of Stardom title uh, reigns to her name, and of course, I wish she could have retired the way that we all would have liked her to. I wish mm. she was here for the boom, because yeah. she would be one of the best, if not the best, but we will have a great time talking about Arisa Shiki. Not really an underdog. <laughs> she was no, kind of dominant. Especially in that second run. She just came in like, yeah, I'm one of the best. Sucker. Yeah, she just she just ended the most dominant wonder of stardom title reign ever, um, which is another favorite of mine. But, you know, she's still current. We don't have to talk about it. She's only 22. It's whatever. Um, I want to <laughs> give a shout out. But. Let's get to the main topic here today. You know, we've talked for 20 Speaking minutes. Of Wonder of Stardom Championship Reigns. Wonder of Stardom Championship Reigns, prodigy type wrestlers. You know, this is a very special individual. This is, of course, Yuzuki Akawa, uh, the the original face of stardom, mm. the original ace. As much as Nanai Takahashi was important to stardom, it was all about Yuzak, Yuzuki Akawa. Um, and her becoming the face is the reason I think I, I don't think I know that stardom got off to the start that they did, right? She mm. she had an entire career before wrestling. Um, mm. and her announcing that she wanted to become a wrestler was a very big deal. Uh she trained, she trained with Fuka. Um and Nanai, I think uh, sure. yeah, well, Nanai helped. It was also Nasawa. mostly Fuka. Yeah. yeah. Mostly Fuka, um, Nassau as well. And she went on to do a lot in a very little time. I think that's another fun thing about her. Like, mm. if you've heard the name Aikawa, uh, Yuzupon, of course, you probably have heard Yuzupon more than you've heard her whole full name, mm. truthfully. Um, she wasn't around for a long time. Trent, you had the perfect comparison or uh perfect uh, I can't think of the analogy word, of and, analogy yeah. of to why how short her career was so I'll I'll let you uh take it away and you know really give your thoughts uh or not thoughts but mostly why she's so important to mm. stardom 
Well, basically, if you were to transport uh, Yuzuki Aikawa to the modern day stardom and let her career run out as it did, (laughs) by the time she retired, she would still be eligible for the future of stardom championship. (laughs) And that's not because of her age. It's because of the amount of time she wrestled for. It was less than three years. And she literally hit the ground running. She was basically the heir heir ascendant from the beginning of stardom. That was the plan. And there was a lot of pressure there because she literally came in with no wrestling background, had six months to train, got her ass beat by Nanai Takahashi to basically make sure she was up for the task, and then was put on the pedestal and said, make stardom work. And obviously she was only there for a few years, but like stardom wouldn't be in the position it was, A, if it didn't have her kind of drawing that initial attention, but like if she couldn't handle the top position, if she couldn't handle being the ace, they would have fumbled. They would have fallen down in those very dicey early years when Joshi didn't have the backing it did, does now or the backing it did 10 years prior to this moment. So she is so integral to stardom, still being around and still having that sort of initial leap forward. Yes, Mayu Watani was in the initial class, but it took a long time for her to be warmed up to the ace that she was. You needed Aikawa to make stardom work. Nanai was fantastic in that kind of mentorship leadership role to begin with, but that would be like bringing Hiroki Goto uh, and Ren Narita into a brand new promotion. You want Goto mm-hmm. to steady the ship and give you something to work with, but yeah. you're building towards Ren Narita becoming the next big thing, and you yeah. need that to hit with Aikara it did. The, the craziest thing that I was thinking about, you know, after watching this match and just kind of, you know, doing my research about her, that you know i already knew about her plenty but mm. doing the research and just thinking about it, it's like you know nanai was a proven name you know yes. for proven enough right and she was there during the the, the dark ages of joshi mm. but she was also there at the end for ajw and still stardom needed the wrestler who had what not even no matches to her name right at one point mm. because the idea of stardom was clearly developing before, when she was having her first match it wasn't that until like you said she proved herself in this match that we're going to talk about when the nai takahashi that they're like all right we got our we got our gal um and <laughs> it's it's one of the more impressive first matches you'll see because of mm. the just what she's able to do right off the rip. Uh, my best comparison, which is just crazy to think about for recency bias, is like imagine if after that match with Utami Hayashishida, right? Miyu Amasaki was made the face of Star, right? Yeah. yeah. Like that's the only comparison I can give you right now because she had a good showing against Utami. Hmm. Good enough, right? Everyone was like, hmm. oh, you know, this makes sense. She's going to be good. You think Akao had a f- even better, much better, I thought. Uh, look against Nanai Takahashi, which you know was much more violent in a lot of ways. But that's that's the comparison. Mm. If if Miyu Amasaki walking in Miyu Amasaki, you know she didn't have a career before like uh, Aikawa, but it's still the rookie comparison that I can make because otherwise I don't yeah. have one for you. It's just uncomparable, really. To well, what in many ways. Did. He kind of fits that mold because she came in with some buzz. Like her name wasn't completely yeah. unknown at the time. And they thrust her in a position where it was sink or swim. You know, her first right. match, she had a big draw against Jungle Kiona. And then immediately, like, That's you know, true. by the end of the year, she had four championships. She'd gone to the final of the five star Grand Prix. Like yeah. she was put in that position. The difference was, even at that moment, Stardom had more backing to kind of prop her up if she didn't immediately hit. Utami was an absolutely right. amazing success story. But Akawa is very much in that same mold without the same support network of if she yeah. doesn't work, then it's okay. We've still got five or six other proven wrestlers. Yeah, it's even Utami, like you said, like I said Amasaki because it's the most recent. Of but course. Utami is the perfect one because she went on to success instantly. Hmm. But you made the perfect point. They had the resources that, okay, if she didn't work, they were going to be fine. Yeah. Um, thank God she did because, you know, we're lucky now. But it's just crazy to think about. It's so – it's there's no comparison that I can think of, at least in modern history, where you do that and you just ride. You you know, mm-hmm. you ride on, you believe, and you find the success that you did. And, of course, we say Nanai was there. Still a big part of it. But – sure. You got to have Aikawa. And uh, that's where we bring now. So, of course, uh, 
Yuzuki Aikawa had a special produce show. It was on October 31st, 2010. So we are almost on the anniversary uh, mm -hmm. by the time this show airs, which is pretty exciting. It was a four match show. It aired on Samurai TV. So if you need to know how big of a deal Yuzuki Aikawa was, you get the idea. Um, and the sh the matches were as followed. You had Haley Hatred versus Basara. You had Yoko Bito versus Iri Susa. You had Tomoka Nakagawa versus Natsuki Tayo versus Hiroyo Matsumoto, two wrestlers especially that we'll have plenty of conversation about later on in the series. And, of course, the main event, Nai Takahashi versus Yuzuki Aikawa with Fuka in her mm. corner. Um the, so so the way this match was made is Aikawa wanted to step into wrestling, like you said, went through the six months. She needed an opponent. Nanai Takahashi stepped up. And this is kind of, you know, Nanai stepping up and then, you know, stardom being made kind of gives you a hint of where they were going, right? And this match, if you just cut it out of everything, right, and you just place it there for a match, don't look at it as who Aikawa was before. Just know she's a rookie wrestler. Hmm. And you look at it as Nai is a veteran and you watch it. You're like, wow, this is, this is her first match, right? Hmm. Like that's, hmm. that's the way I watched because after watching it, I was just like in awe because I knew Aikawa was a special wrestler in her miniature career. It's miniature because it just wasn't long. She achieved a lot, but it wasn't long. Hmm. Um, and you know, her kicks were always a standout and they were they were as stiff as hell in this match they were that's very noticeable probably, that's probably the thing that caught my eye the most because a lot of when you see a lot of rookies come in even if they have martial arts backgrounds like yuzuki Aikawa had taekwondo experience before coming into this so she didn't know how to kick but it's very different coming into a situation like pro wrestling where you've got to work the kicks you've got to make it look good but you can't actually, or you know, you try not to knock someone out. And I think you sort of compare, say, her to say a uh, Julia Nagano, who had struggled for a little while mm. to find the power important. How do I make this look good without actually doing damage? Mm. Admittedly, Nanae Takahashi can take a bit of a beating in this situation, but Aikawa was not holding back with these kicks. And it's so rare to see someone brand new to the sport actually finding that groove. And look, she didn't always nail them with the same kind of ferocity when she was facing the other rookies and the lower card wrestlers. But that straight away shows you that A, both of them have the trust in how to do this and B, that she gets that you've got to make this look good and how to make pro wrestling work. So it's fantastic. Like just on that alone, you're going, okay, this is not your regular rookie. Yeah, no, she wasn't at all. And... She the beating that she took in this match is very important because mm. this is how they knew, right? Yes, this is how they knew that she could be the one. Um, because as old school Joshi wrestlers often do, they don't really hold back, they don't really care who you are, mm. they they're just going to inflict the violence and they're gonna see if you can hang. Mm. And at the end of this match, when it was over. He kind of just sat there, uh, or at least I did, and I was like, "And she, she said she wanted to keep doing this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, she, she wanted to keep doing this after mm. Nanai held nothing back, right? And that's, I think, it's just such a reason to appreciate her and who she would become. Because mm. again, she didn't have to do this." No, she she had a career. To do this. She had a career, a very successful career. Yes, and she said, eh, "You know what? Let's let's do this. Let's see where it goes." She has her debut, like I said, at this her own show. Right, it's her hmm. own show. There's no one supporting it. Well, yeah, you, you know what we mean there. Yeah, officially, right? She was a grab. Uh, is it? She was an idol for those. Yeah, Gravour idol. Yeah, Gravour idol and you know if you look up Yuzuki Akawa you're gonna see probably more of her that career than wrestling honestly mm. like that's just the truth because again yeah. she she did that for a long time and she wasn't wrestling for a long time either um one of my favorite things is like so she had the background in uh taekwondo mm -hmm. and the reason she liked rest or 
started to like wrestling was in 2008. She watched uh, All Japan's Champion Carnival. Yes. Yes. Which is like just that's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's so confusing because typically stardom wrestlers get into pro wrestling through Dragon Gate. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's but true. What, and they watch promotions that aren't Dragon Gate. What is this? That, that, but to me, it's just so weird. Like anytime someone watches all Japan of that time, like, mm. because, you know, if you watch old school Puro, it's like different, but that was of course after everything had happened. And it's just mm. like, for me, I just take a step back and I'm like, so this idol just watched champion carnival and was like, yep, I got to do that. It's just <laughs> such a funny thing to think um but it's so cool too um and i'm happy she did right i'm happy she yeah. did as a fan so uh if we go back to the match you kind of get to see that fiery baby face instantly mm -hmm. and that's that's something you don't teach you can't teach that you either have it or you don't right like current day unagi sayaka may have not been great at wrestling and i use her as a example because i watched her get her ass beat for seven straight matches <laughs> similar match she, rounds too right she may have not had a great in-ring ability at the beginning mm. but she had that fiery baby face ability about her and she always fought back even though she got hit harder and harder and harder and it's just such a fun comparison to make because obviously aikawa's much more historic and much I mean, she was a better wrestler too but with similar um pre wrestling careers like you said yeah. it's it's an easy comparison to make and you know they do connect eventually down the line which is very funny but did you notice that too like i know we noticed the kicks and the violence on those kicks mm. but just her ability to get up and fight back i was like i was you don't you you don't do that in your first match, but she did. Especially when you've only got six months to work on it, because obviously the first thing you're going to focus on in wrestling is learning how to take bumps and how to do moves and how to work safely. You want the character work, you want the fundamentals of the storytelling there, but ultimately, if you're going to have one or the other, you want to be a safe wrestler and know how to bump. But yeah, it was just a natural thing for her, it felt like. And obviously, Fuka was a fantastic teacher. It's not just Akawa that you can look at for that. She trained so many fantastic talents. But it was clear that she understood working a crowd and making them invested and little things like uh, selling the face and sort of showing the pain and showing the desperation to get up. That's not something that necessarily comes to even natural storytellers from the first match. You often see it in bits and pieces, but yeah. like you watch Aikawa's match here with Nanae Takahashi. And if you didn't know it was a first match, you probably wouldn't pick it as a first match. You'd think, oh, look, might be six or seven months into the career. They're just starting to build her up into something of worth. But this is the very first time she stepped in a ring with people watching and she had to deliver. And she, she delivered on the key thing. She made it look legitimate and she made you believe what she was going through. Partly because she was getting beat up. Like we do say at times with stardom, like when they take a beating and they're selling it, it's like, yeah, they're selling it, but they're also legitimately in pain. She had a swollen left eye by the end of this because none of them whacked her. You know, but you've still got to make that believable. Right. And, you know, even the opening of the match, you could kind of see she was nervous. She was scared. Yeah, just a little nervous. Like she right? didn't, it wasn't overtaking, but if you watch the face, you're like, yeah, like, she's coming through her mind. It's one of those things like, say you're about to like walk through the door to an interview, like a job interview or something. You're mm. like, Phew. all right, here we go. Right? Like you're, you're just yeah. trying to calm yourself down. And the best part is she like puts her hands up, I'm pretty sure. And she's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> One I wrestler, I've, I've just got to draw, draw this in that did it brilliantly. Is if you watch it, Zumi's first match, mm. yeah, just a little exhibition match she did when she was like 11 or something, you can see she's nervous. Like, yeah. naturally, she's a kid in this ring. As soon as the bell rings, though, her face just changes and it's like it just activates yeah. her. And it's a little bit like this here. I'm not sure if it times mm. up perfectly with the bell ringing, but the moment it is go time. She switches from I'm nervous, what am I doing, to okay, I'm in a fight and I'm making you believe that I'm up against this champion-level wrestler and I'm going to bring it everything that I can. 
Yeah. Um, by the way, the f- the match that or the end of the champion carnival, I had to look this up because I was saying, <laughs> like, I remember this match because it's one of my favorite uh, matches. The final was I completely forgot about it, 2008 Suwama versus Hiroshi Tanahashi when Hiroshi Tanahashi played heel in all Japan, mm. which, by the way, fantastic run. But that's not about the show. Uh, <laughs> but I, it's funny that it says champion carnival and then you read. Oh, it was him. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, well. Tanahashi right, would get a lot of people into wrestling. And you can see elements of yeah. the Tanahashi. Not so much the heel Tanahashi style, but, like, if you told me Akara would watch Babyface baby face. Tanahashi, oh, yeah. I would believe that. Just yeah, the way yeah. she carried herself. For sure. Um, and... I love watching Aikawa, and this is kind of just breaking off from that match because, again, we went off of one match, um, <laughs> is that you just feel her star power even in this, but oh, in the future, it's like every single time she shows up, she was everything you want in the face of your company, right? Mm. There's no reason Stardom said, yeah, we're going with her. Oh, she has how many matches to her? It doesn't matter. We're going with her. Um, it helps that popularity before wrestling, and it helps do all that. But at the end of the day, you got to put up or shut up in the ring, um, as we have always seen with people that come in, right? Like, celebrities come into wrestling all the time nowadays. And, mm. you know, as an idol there, she was very well known, and she did that. And I can't, I can't stress enough that because you, everyone that's listening to this show right now, needs to go watch that match. Whether you know who Yuzu Pond is or you don't, you're going to know her because she's a very key part, right? She was, she's the before threedom part yes. of this. Yes, <laughs> Like, that's my best way to explain it. Like, if you want to talk about before threedom, it's Yuzu Pond and everything else, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. right? Like, that's how important she was. Uh, I mean, yeah, you've got, like, wrestlers that you would see coming to prominence later, but you needed that steadying period early on. You needed that first person to get behind. And obviously, like being a Gravel Idol, you do bring in that fan base, but you, it's not just as simple as, oh, I'll bring in a pretty face and put them in the ring and make it work. That's what WWE tried in the mid-2000s, and we saw how that worked for women's wrestling. Mm-hmm. But you've got to have the commitment and not only for the wrestler to put in the hard yards and take the beatings, but for the promotion to put, put in that effort and make sure that they're not, you know, just taking it cruisy and relying on looks. You know, she could have relied on being the name that she was, but she recognised that you have to step up to the plate. If you're going to be the face of a company, you have to be able to lead them in the ring as well as just being, oh, that's the person I saw in a magazine once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as she would go on to be Wonder of Stardom champion, the first, of course, yes. and it, it, that's really a reign that, again helps establish stardom more than anything um and helps establish the white belt as well which i think is the white belt which, because we talk about the white belt having a certain characteristic to it it all starts with her it all starts with her because right they they establish both belts at the same time it's not mm. like one came before the other but sometimes it does feel that way i don't know about you but as a fan just like if you look back on stardom history obviously you could see that they start at the same time (laughs) but there's just something about the one wonder of stardom title that feels like it has more history at times because of what she did in that first reign to like you said establish that belt and what it's supposed to mean right the world of stardom title it's a a world title Hmm. like you don't really you don't really go very different places that is the world title that's what this is but this title has meaning to it that I always, anytime someone asks me like oh so it's like the intercontinental title no no it's not it's actually mm. not at all like an intercontinental title it's it's the storytelling emotional it's everything it's the heart of stardom it is the heart of stardom that's why the people that hold it are very specific except mm. for santana garrett and <laughs> <laughs> and it it's why, you know, you saw fans want Jungle Kiona to win it. It's why you saw f- or see fans currently want to see the likes of a Micah win it or, you know, wrestlers like that because mm. they feel like they have that heart to go on and win it. And, I mean, to me, I always felt if Jungle were to win a belt, one of the top belts, that one 
was the one. Oh, and I'm sure. sure you feel the same. I'm sure yeah. you feel the same. She always felt more connected in that area, and not just because the red belt typically did require a certain level of yeah. gravitas that maybe she never reached, but it, it suited her character style, you know, the underdog fighting through. Mm -hmm. You can tell those stories so much easier with the white belt versus the red yeah. because the red is all about being the very best, being the absolute, being the undefeatable. Mm -hmm. That's why Shuri's a red belt champion, not a white belt champion, because it just wouldn't make the same level of sense. You can tell those stories so much better, and Aikawa coming in as the, you know, not necessarily a pure underdog once she got involved in stardom, but just right. her character style and the way she represented stardom. There's a reason why she was given that championship and not the red belt, even though she was the face of the company. Exactly. And this is kind of us playing the game now because Aikawa was so important to that, is that there's a reason so few people hold both. Mm, right. Mm. And we'll get into that more as the show goes on, but there's a reason, you know, you win one or the other. You don't win yes. both. It's a select few who are able to really capture that. It's funny, you know, we're watching Julia now who's going to very likely be the next person to hold <laughs> both. And she almost feels like she would fit the white belt now way more than she did then. Because it feels like that form of her was more of a world champion. And this one's mm. more of the emotional. She's gone through a lot. She's ready for that, you know, emotional story win. It's so it's so funny how you kind of see that. But it's a select few. It's a select crew. But Aikawa, without Aikawa, without use upon holding that belt for as long as she did and having the matches that she did, it's not the same. Stardom's not the same. That title is as enshrined in history as any title to a company can be. Mm. Um, and it's because of her and, and, and back to this match, of course, seeing her just start out and naturally. And there's a great video, of course, on use upon's uh, YouTube where mm. her and I, all these years later, watch it together. Yeah. Um, it's hard to watch if you want to watch the full match. Cause they stop it multiple times, which is very funny, <laughs> but like, I, after watching you just watch them uh, like nanai and her would just laugh at like nanai kicking her ass or something mm, yeah, or then, yeah. like use a pause like in a boston in the boston crab and she's like come on come on get to the rope get to the rope it's like it's all in japanese so like it's one of the many times i just sit there i'm like why can't i <laughs> why can't i know but you can watch it and get like a bit you, you'll just have a big smile on your face a lot of context together. clues yeah, just like the history, you know, the clear friendship they have, mm. and just seeing them react to a match that unofficially started stardom in a lot of ways. That's what that's why we started with this. This, yeah, this is maybe our first episode, but this is the unofficial start to start. Yeah, we, we were both uh, I cowered just before we started recording this, a little bit of a nervous face going, We got this, okay, we got this, yeah, we can do this. Um, I think it's important. One thing that you kind of alluded to, which is important, is you can see that friendship now when they're sort of looking back, but I think there had to be that friendship beforehand and that trust because, I mean, there is a bit of a running joke that Nanai Takahashi doesn't necessarily like to put a lot of people over at times. And obviously she won this match, but she gave a lot of offense to use upon in this particular match. You know, it wasn't just a case of her beating up a rookie and all about her surviving. Aikawa got to show what she was all about. And I think the best way to showcase this is there was one moment there where, you know, Nanaya's on the top rope. She gets kicked a couple mm. of times. She goes to the outside and she gets a 19 count. You know, yeah, nearly gets counted out in the ring. Now, you'll see rookies maybe surprise a veteran with a uh, sort of a flash pin and get a two count and a ooh and an ah from the audience. But for an established wrestler like Nanai to give a 19 count on the outside, that signifies you're getting your ass beat and that you're struggling <laughs> to get back in the ring and keep going after a count of 20. You don't see that a lot. And that's, you know, obviously Nanai was coming in. She needed to make use upon look good and make sure she was there and give her a little bit of the hazing. But she gave a lot to Aikawa. She made her look far more than just the first match rookie. Goes a long way. I mean, if you mm. ever, like, read or get or kind of explain or have someone explain to you how this match goes, a lot of the time you'll just hear, like, oh, yeah, Aikawa was beat up and, you know, she took a lot and, you yeah. know, it was a proving ground. But if you watch it, you're like, yeah, it was that, but there was so much more to it, right? There was so much more mm. offense for her and so many moments for her. Um, you know, she's not wearing her signature yellow gear, so that's also weird. She hasn't like, got that yet. 
that's a fun thing to play there. It's like if you see pictures of her, she's always got that signature yellow, um, one way or the other. Um, but she didn't have that yet. And and this is just the beginning of us uh, you know, crushing over and loving the greatness of Yuzuki Aikawa. And I think that's <laughs> a lot of the fun of it here. That's why we're doing this show. Mm. Um, like that's why I'm so excited to start because that's where we're <laughs> that's where we're beginning is mm. with Aikawa with Nanai with all these different things, and like we said, we'll jump with back. Rookie Mayu with the blue Rookie pants, Mayu. with one of them up uh, up the shin a little bit more. You know that classic idol kind of dance look, which uh, I, is so weird to see now. And that's that's where we start. So, of course, uh, Trent, any uh, final thoughts on this match? Um, where we're going with this show? before I kind of introduce where we are going next with this show. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, like, we've given you a good idea of where Akawa was and kind of mentioned where, you know, okay, she was a pretty big deal in stardom, but if you aren't fully aware of who she was in the stardom war outside of maybe what we've mentioned, here's the stuff you need to know. Now, she was the Wonder of Stardom champion, held that for 600 days, plus days, had eight defences. First ever goddess of stardom tag team champion. So they put that belt on her from the start too. She didn't lose either. Both were vacated. First ever five-star Amazing. Grand Prix winner in uh, 2012. And then it's not just within stardom. Tokyo Sports gave her the uh, Joshi Puroresu Grand Prize 2011 and 2012. First to ever go back-to-back. And only Io Shirai has done it since. Nikon Sports gave her the Joshi Puroresu MVP in 2011 and 2012, the Joshi Tag Award in 2011, and the Joshi Fighting Spirit Award in 2011, and even the Joshi Newcomer Award in 2010 with just one match to her name at that point. So obviously, like, Aikawa was important to the beginning of stardom, but it wasn't just stardom, just kind of, hey, this person matters. Like, she Mm -hmm. was a big deal in the Joshi world, which was still recovering after the AJW hangover, so to speak. During this sort of regrowth period for Joshi Wrestling, she was at that forefront for the few years that she was there. Yeah, she's kind of the reason, like, there, there's so much excitement around someone like a Yuki Rai in mm. TJPW, right? Because similar, you know, she wants to do wrestling. She's a successful idol, different type of yeah. idol, but successful yeah. idol nonetheless. I mean, it's it's so interesting to see that because you can take Aikawa's career and all those accolades and you can kind of look into all right who who was an idol that stepped mm. into wrestling and there's a lot of them uh, yeah. um right and there was a lot of them before her too there were mm. idols before her. I'm not saying she was the first but she kind of helped restart it in a lot of yeah. ways and like, proves that you can be legitimate because I do think especially for western fans coming in who don't necessarily know the backstory of uh Joshi wrestling. You might hear like Amina Shirakawa, Unagi Sayaka coming from gravure backgrounds and idol backgrounds and going, oh, well, then they're just there for looks and, you know, to appeal to the men's demographic because, oh, look at their bodies. But the reality is that these wrestlers come in and they take it seriously and they actually improve their wrestling. They're not just models there for the sake of being models. They'll get their ass beat. They'll give it right back. And Aikawa is the perfect example of why that kind of strategy can pay off. Yep, 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 and like we said, paying off. I mean, it's paid off for stardom. It's all paid mm. off for stardom, but we are going to continue this stardom roll road, stardom road. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I knew I was going to mess Roll up down the time. road. Yeah, we're going to roll down the road. We're going to continue this stardom road with the birth of Nova, the very mm-hmm. first stardom show that is on Stardom World. So, yes. you know, we don't have to, we don't have to go hunting for that one, but I mean... First unofficial start, right? We're starting here with the unofficial start mm. with using Pawn's first match, and now we're going to go to the official start. That first we're not doing show. pure chronological, but for the sake of these first couple episodes, we are keeping it simple, starting where it all began. Yeah, I mean, people, people are going to find out very quickly how non chronological we're going <laughs> after the next episode, yes. but this is very important. Um, just use Pawn got to do a lot of things, she did get to wrestle by the way, um, in all japan which is very nice um mm. i think she teamed with keiji muto off the top of my head which is very cool but that birth of nova show of course off uh it is a five match show and there's a couple names that you will very much know on there uh yes. that may be de- debuting um 
you know, debuting tag matches, singles matches, a lot of prominent names in stardom history are on that show. So it's going to be a lot. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, so birth of Nova, that will be episode two, but this was episode one. Yes. Of the stardom road here on the count out network podcast podcast network damn I'm so close i'm so network close podcast network Isn't it? Listen, I, I i you know i do too many podcasts i get them all confused it's as it's long as you're shouting out. out the right place that's hosting us that's, that's true that's start. true that yeah. is, this is the count up podcast network yes. uh you can check out the many shows on this you know dose of death my other show ring post radio uh there's so many other shows you could uh subscribe to the patreon if you want for all the goodies on there. I don't have these things right now. I never. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be frank here at the end. <laughs> I never do these things, even on my own shows that are on other Patreons. So I apologize. But yeah, please check out everyone else's work here on the network. Um, Trent, where can the people find you if this is their very first time listening to you? Yeah, so if this is the first time you've heard the dulcet tones of my Australian accent, uh, you can check me out. Look, I, I write and podcast for a couple of different places. I'm going to keep it simple. Just go to at One Up Culture on Twitter, and you can find all the stuff I do, all the stuff I'm all about. And I'm looking forward to adding more and more Stardom Road episodes to that catalogue. So, yeah, come check it out. Come say hello. Tell me how great Jungle Kiona is, and I'll tell you how smart you are. No comment. Uh, <laughs> you can course, be smarter than Scott by saying it. That's true. That's true. You can be smarter than me. It doesn't take much either way anyways. But alas, uh, of course, I am Scott. Uh, you can follow me at Scott E Wrestling on Twitter. You can check out all my other podcasts if you want to to hear my current thoughts about Joshi Pro Wrestling because I always have many. But please make sure to subscribe here to the Stardom Road. You don't want to miss an episode because, like we said, a bi-weekly show. Every other week, we will be here to talk about Stardom's history. So make sure to subscribe. That's more important to me than following me on Twitter. Because I want everyone to listen to this. Because, you know, this wasn't a perfect episode, mostly because of me. But, but, uh, it was a lot of fun. Because we went off of one match, Trent. And we made it to an hour. We went off one match. Nothing else. <laughs> That's uh, that's very concerning for our future when we're getting to full show episodes like next fortnight. Well, Admittedly, they're not long matches, but um, yeah. we've proven we can stretch a five minute match into a thirty minute discussion in the past. So, hey, we had to, we had to talk about how we became Stardom fans yeah, and all yeah. that good stuff. But but you yeah, you be- guys, you listeners, have a fortnight to maybe watch the first ever show if you mm. haven't, or even if you have, rewatch it so you can go along this road with us and sort yes. of you know yeah, just so you're not coming in completely blind because it can be difficult. But now you can sort of see where we're coming from with some of these wrestlers as well, yes. and you get to see the very first match for some very important names in Stardom's history. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just as exciting. Uh, so for Trent, I'm Scott. This was the Stardom Road Podcast. Until next time, everybody. So long. See ya. This has been a Count Out Podcast. Hey, guys, gals, and non-binary pals. It's Amanda Bones. And I'm Ashley. Of how to talk to your friend about wrestling, the podcast on the Count Out Wrestling Podcast Network, a weekly show where we talk about all of our favorite things, babes, blood, and brutality. We also talk about other fun things, like is Kenny Omega finally too tan? And how much blood is too much blood? Because that looks like way too much blood. (laughs) So join us on the adventure of teaching me, Amanda Bones, about wrestling.